John McGraw in 1900 had what I consider to be the most interesting and really the most fascinating season in baseball history, and yet nobody talks about it. In fact, uh, none of his biographers, including his Sabre biography, his Wikipedia biography, even his major biographer, um, Charles Alexander, really talk about this season all that much. And John McGraw himself in his own autobiography barely even refers to it. So let's learn a little bit more here about 1900 and what happened to John McGraw. Now, um, so here, as you can see, uh, I have uh, Libre Wolf open here, and um, we're taking a quick look at uh, John McGraw's page over on Baseball Reference. John McGraw in 1899 was almost certainly the best player in the National League. Um, I mean, he hit 391 with a 547 on base percentage, um, in large part due to his 124 walks. Um, his uh, OPS Plus, which, as we all know, loves um, on base percentage, was 168. Um, I, he was such an incredible player that um, if we take a quick look over here at uh, the 1899 National League, we go over, let's see what we can find here. We're going over to uh, batting value. Um, what we will see as we start um, organizing this by war is that John McGraw ends up up here with Ed Delahanty for number one. Um, I would consider McGraw probably to have had a better season that year overall. I mean, among other things, you will notice when you look closely at this that he had actual positive defensive um, wins above replacement. Um, and, uh, I mean, he was only 26 years old at the time. I mean, he just had an absolute incredible season there um, in uh, uh, 19, 1899, better than Honus Wagner's season, and better, by the way, by a pretty significant margin. Um, and I would also say that um, playing third base for Baltimore was probably more valuable as a fielder than playing outfield for uh, Philadelphia. Um, that's kind of an argument for another day. But it goes beyond a doubt that in 1899, John McGraw was like great. I mean, an absolute incredible player, a superstar. But there were things happening behind the scenes. Now, you probably know this already. In fact, you're probably wondering, why in the world am I watching this video to know, to learn something I already know? So in 1899, right at the end of the season, the National League decided to contract four teams. And it decided to get rid of these teams um, largely because um, they were the victims of serial ownership, where one person owned more than one team. And they took the stars from the good team and put them on the other team that they liked. And so Honus Wagner, for example, uh, went from Louisville over to Pittsburgh, where he became a staple with the Pittsburgh Pirates, right? The Pirates um, largely became a great team at the turn of the 20th century because they had all the stars from Louisville on their side. Um, similarly, Brooklyn, uh, the Brooklyn team uh, was also owned, the owner of the Brooklyn team that is also owned the Baltimore Orioles. And so he took a lot of the great Baltimore Orioles players and put them on Brooklyn. And that's why you read stories about the Brooklyn team in 1899 and 1900 and so on getting in fights with other players and cheating and you know doing all sorts of awful things well they were kind of the continuation of uh, what we would call the original Orioles of the uh, 1890s that were known for doing that sort of thing right John McGraw wanted to stay in Baltimore um, and he wanted baseball to stay in Baltimore and uh, in 1899 as a result he wound up not only staying in Baltimore but he wound up being the manager of the team he was, uh, how old was he again? He was 26 years old that year, and this is the year he turns 26. When is his birthday? Um, his birthday is April 7th. So he turns 26 right at the very beginning of the season. As a 26-year-old, he's managing this team filled with players who are older than him, the players that he knows, more or less. Um, and uh, he is not only managing the team, but he's also the best player, not just on the team, but is largely the greatest player in all of organized baseball in 1899. That itself is quite remarkable. However, the rumors that they heard through the season end up becoming true, and uh, the Orioles, who uh, finished in fourth place, um, end up losing the franchise. They just fold. They don't move anywhere. They don't do anything. They just go away. Um, it was the Orioles, the team of Louisville, the uh, Cleveland Spiders, and um, uh, the team of Washington, D.C., the uh, original Nationals, that all were contracted and sort of discarded by the National League. We don't want to play with these toys anymore. Um, John McGraw refused to go to Brooklyn, uh, as the story goes, um, and um, instead um, he and uh, Wilbur Robinson and another player from that or uh, Orioles team were sold for $19,000 collectively to St. Louis. And so when you look at John McGraw's playing record, you see that in 1900 he um, was on the St. Louis roster. But what you won't see here is the fact that John McGraw in 1900 was a early season holdout. In fact, he held out for about a month. 
Now, this is the sort of thing you only really learn if you read through the original newspapers, right? Because the histories, the histories will give you a little taste of it, but reading through the newspapers will let you know what was happening. This wasn't just, oh, John McGraw was some obscure player going to St. Louis and he held out and nobody cared. No, John McGraw was like first page news and like uh, uh, at least sports page, head of the sports page news in like every news, um, uh, sporting newspaper and every sporting section around the country. I mean, everything that this guy did was big news. He was running around trying to form another major league, is what was happening at the time. There were rumors going around about a revival of the American Association, and there are tons of old articles of McGraw going to Philadelphia to meet with people and even going up to New York to meet with people and then going down to you know, uh, Louisville to meet with people and going up and down and left and right and everywhere trying to get something going. Um, that's what he was doing while he was holding out and waiting for a contract offer that would be acceptable from St. Louis. St. Louis finally, as their the beginning of their season was quite disastrous, came in with a contract offer that was uh, really unprecedented in baseball history. Um, he, uh, John McGraw, in the end, signed for $10,000 for a single season for a contract that did not have a reserve clause. Now, as you know, the reserve clause at the time was a standard contract in all of organized baseball, which says basically that you have to stay with this team. You cannot be a free agent after your contract expires. The contract basically automatically renews. And if you decide that you don't like the contract and you're a holdout and so on, you're barred from playing from any other team. They have um, exclusive rights to you. John McGraw did not have this in his contract with St. Louis, and uh, you better believe that it was by his own choosing. In fact, he says in his autobiography that he designed this so that he wouldn't be a slave to the reserve clause. This is this biography that came out in 1923, by the way. Interesting stuff. So McGraw was a holdout at the beginning of the season in 1900. He was a successful holdout, one of the most successful holdouts in baseball history. He earned a contract that was higher than any other player before him had ever earned, $10,000 a year, which is crazy. Um, and uh, he had a contract that had absolutely no restrictions um, imposed by the reserve clause. Then, as the season starts, and as you go along, McGraw plays incredibly well at the beginning of the season before being injured, um, and uh, has some run-ins with the uh, manager who was Patsy Tabot. So he and Patsy Tabot had um, ma run-ins earlier throughout the 1890s in the National League, since Patsy was managing the team that was originally in Cleveland. And uh, McGraw and Patsy had uh, their share of run-ins and difficulties, and there are rumors that come out in the newspapers that McGraw might be gunning for the managerial position of the St. Louis team and might be trying to get Tabo out. Well, that's kind of exactly what happened. So what happens here is we go through the uh, 1900 season is uh, the uh, Cardinals wind up 42-50. Uh, and 50. Let's see if we can look qu real quickly at their schedule see where they were here in the standings when they were 42 and 50 they were in uh, seventh place out of uh, eight teams 15 games off the pace and not playing well this is on uh, august 19th and if you read again the st louis newspapers or the cincinnati inquirer or any good baseball newspaper from you know probably around mid-july to this period you will see the rumors that i'm talking about um what happened officially, and this is the part that always gets to me, what happened officially is the replacement manager was this guy, Lou, Louis Heilbronner. I don't know why they call him Louis on all baseball reference. If you read the original sources, they called him Louis. Um, Louis Heilbronner, who has one of those great German last names, um, was named the manager despite the fact that he was like a club secretary with absolutely no on-field baseball experience whatsoever. And despite the fact that on the bench was a man who had been a successful manager for the Baltimore Orioles, the team the season before, who knew how to get players together, knew how to round them up. Basically, even though John McGraw denies this in his official biography, what is clear when you look at the history is that John McGraw became the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals in mid-August uh, 1900. And he actually had some success. As you can see, it wasn't exactly a great winning record. But in terms of the uh, position and the standings, the Cardinals wound up fifth place at the end of the season, um, which isn't bad considering what he was given and the problems that existed on the team. So... <laughs> John McGraw, once again in 1900, went from being an early season holdout, meaning that he had no contract, um, to not only playing on the team 
and not only having an excellent, excellent season on the field, um, he was uh, injured for part of the season and was sick for another part of it. He still hits 344 with a 505 on base percentage, 85 walks in uh, what, 447 plate appearances, and a 416 slugging percentage. So it's a 157 OPS plus. If you look at the WAR for that year, he ends up being ranked as like the fifth player in terms of National League uh, production. I would say that if you account for the fact that he was injured or um, holding out for about a third of the season, he probably is closer to the best player in the National League. Um, not only does he play that well, but he ends up managing the team. Even though he was an early season holdout, he ends up managing the team by the end of the season and then has himself set up to help start the American League the next year. This is one of the most fascinating seasons in baseball history, and I am absolutely flabbergasted as to why baseball historians loudly ignore this and just you know go on their merry way and don't think about talking about it and don't think about looking into this this season is so remarkable that i mean it just defies description i think it's more remarkable than the 1908 honus wagner season that everybody talks about and look at how great he is compared to the league and all this other stuff you know i mean john mcgraw didn't have a contract at the beginning of 1900 and he wound up running the team right that is impressive Anyway, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed this. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.